The wound assessment process has two distinct components, the assessment of the patient and subsequent assessment of the wound. We've already heard how the wound has adversely affected Mary, both psychologically and socially. We will need to assess any factors that can impede healing, such as mobility problems, nutritional status, underlying disease and sleep patterns, especially if pain and stress are a problem. In addition, we will take a medication history. We need to assess Mary's peripheral circulation by completing an ankle or toe brachial pressure index using a Doppler ultrasound machine. A person's age and other conditions such as incontinence, smoking or taking recreational drugs can also delay the healing process. In order to establish this latter information, we have to ask some sensitive and probing questions and must be aware of how we approach these more delicate inquiries. Wound assessment may involve examining parts of the body an individual would rather not have on show, so we must ensure we respect Mary's privacy and dignity. It has to follow a systematic approach and importantly, at the end of the assessment, we need to make a diagnosis. A leg ulcer is not a diagnosis. All it tells us is where on the body the wound is. What we need to decide is the cause of the ulcer. Is it arterial or venous in origin? Or caused by something else, such as an autoimmune disease, for example, pioderma gangrenosum? Without a diagnosis, we are unable to initiate an appropriate plan of care for Mary. When we have a diagnosis, we need to record it correctly. For example, with pressure damage, skin tears and diabetic foot ulceration, we should use the correct categorization or classification systems. In addition, acute wounds, such as burns, have their own classification system to record depth and amount of surface area of the skin that has been damaged. The location of the wound will help with making the diagnosis, as venous leg ulcers occur in the gaiter area, which is above the ankle and below the knee. And pressure ulcers are found over bony prominences, such as the sacrum, or under medical advices such as oxygen tubing. Acute wounds caused by trauma can be found on any part of the body. An example of an acute wound on the lower limb is a pre-tibial laceration. Once we know the cause, it would be helpful to know how old the wound is, as wounds of longer duration tend to be more of a challenge to heal. We can now move on to assessing the limb and generally look for evidence of previous trauma, deformities, or surgery such as amputation. We can assess if there is generalized edema and if there are signs of lipodermatosclerosis, which includes brown staining on the white skin, an altered leg shape which is wider at the knee and narrower at the ankle, sometimes called an inverted champagne bottle shape, dilated veins around the ankle and white patches of ischemic skin called atrophy blanche. Is the skin dry and in its worst form is there a buildup of dry hyperkeratotic plaques? There may be eczema present that can be wet or dry but always itchy. In general, is the skin fragile? As if so, we will need to think about using dressing products that do not cause any trauma on application or removal. In acute wounds, for example a closed surgical wound, we need to monitor the surrounding skin for erythema, which if it persists after the expected 48 hours post-surgery, we will probably investigate further, as the surgical wound may be infected. Our eyes can now focus on the edge of Mary's ulcer. As you can see, there is no undermining, which tends to occur more often in pressure ulceration. If undermining did exist, we would gently probe under the edge of the wound to establish its true size. As with undermining, the wound is larger than what you see on the surface. We will need to ensure we accurately measure the length, width and depth of the ulcer. There is no callus visible around Mary's ulcer, and this tends to occur in diabetic foot ulceration. 
especially on the plantar surface of the foot. The edge of Mary's ulcer is not rolled. If this were the case, we would need to obtain medical advice, as malignancy may be present. In Mary's case, the edge of the wound looks static, as there is no evidence on migrating pink epithelial tissue spreading across the wound bed from the wound edges, or appearing as white dots in the wound bed, where the epithelial tissue is growing from old hair follicle sites. What we can see is clear cirrus exudate running onto the surrounding skin. The exudate we see on Mary's skin is the normal color and watery consistency of exudate. However, it can be yellow, green, and thick in infection if present, and bloodstained if the wound has been traumatized. It is notoriously difficult to measure the amount of exudate, and often examining the dressing you have removed may help with this. We know we get higher levels of exudate if edema and infection are present. In surgical wounds, the exudate levels are higher post-surgery and reduce in amount as the wound heals. As well as a change in the type and amount of exudate, a local infected wound would present with redness, erythema of the surrounding skin, and may have an offensive odor. Rather than a healthy red granulating wound bed, it may contain yellow or green slough or black or brown necrosis, which can contribute to the odor and provide a breeding ground for bacteria. In addition, Mary would be feeling generally unwell and may have pyrexia and tachycardia. Remember that individuals who are immune suppressed, have diabetes mellitus, may not present with the classic signs of infection I've just mentioned and a white cell count, CRP and ESR blood tests, may help with the diagnosis of infection in these individuals. Biofilms are colonies of bacteria in a wound that are able to defend themselves from systemic antibiotics. A biofilm is invisible to the naked eye, but are thought to be present in most chronic wounds that have a wet and slimy appearance. New pain or an increase in pain can be a sign of wound infection we should measure wound pain using a validated pain tool. We need to know if the pain is what can be expected. For example, nociceptive pain, experienced at dressing changes, or nerve pain, neuropathic pain, due to damage to the nerves in the wound bed. This difference is important, as they require different medication to treat each type. If we look closely at Mary's ulcer bed, we can see a mixture of red granulation tissue and yellow slough. It's helpful to record the percentage of the different tissue types, necrosis, slough, granulation, and epithelial tissue. An increase in the former two would indicate wound deterioration, and the latter two indicating healing. In a traumatic wound, we have to closely examine the wound bed to ensure any possible contaminants are identified and removed from the wound bed. We have now completed our assessment of Mary, her limb and her wound bed. It's important all this is accurately recorded so we can share our findings with our colleagues. Importantly, we need to be able to communicate our findings to Mary so she has an understanding of the cause of her ulcer, any signs of infection, which she does not have, and what we expect the ulcer to look like as it progresses to healing, and what sign she needs to alert us to if the wound deteriorates, such as meloda or an increase in pain. We will need to check that she has understood why the assessment was important and what plan of care we recommend with the underlying rationale. If we achieve this, Hopefully Mary will feel a part of the decision-making process and become actively involved in her ulcer treatment. One essential completed, nine to go. Join us and continue your journey as we investigate our second essential of wound healing. Consider wound vascularization and oxygenation.